I'm assuming your life. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to the shop. Tonight we're going to be looking at hand planes and I'm going to be showing some of the common problems because probably about 50% of the questions that I get on a regular basis are, my hand plane is doing this, how do I fix it? And this is one of these skills that is, is kind of basic to everything else. And once you understand the mechanics of the hand plane and how it all comes together, a lot of these things really suddenly make sense of like, oh, this is happening, that means I need to change this. And now, these are very kind of compl complicated items, and so I'm not going to be able to hit all the problems. Uh, but if you have a particular problem or uh, something you'd like me to figure out, throw that in the chat down below. If you are watching this as a recorded and it's not live, I will have links down below with timestamps beside it so you can jump close to where it is in the uh, in the video and have an idea of uh, where that question was asked. So tonight we're actually going to be diving into the hand planes. Usually this is the point in which I'm going to tell you about the events coming up, um, but <laughs> yeah. I don't know why not. I think we have an answer to that now. <laughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, the, for those of you who joined us in our, our last live, uh, well, last week we weren't able to get it because of a bunch of things going on. Um, life has been crazy busy for one reason or another. Um, but we had problems with the, the cameras last time connecting in and out. I finally have new power cords for them, so hopefully uh, we will have solid signals on both cameras. So <laughs> we're slowly getting things better here. But uh, yeah, let's, let's take a look at the, the, the hand planes. Now we're going to mostly be looking at the bevel down, traditional Bailey style plane. Um, the bevel up, Stanley 62 or block angle, uh, block angle, block plane. Wow, I got something in my throat. Um, they're a little bit more basic, and that's why uh, you know a lot of beginners tend to gravitate gravitate towards a bevel up, low angle plane because there isn't a whole lot of difference in them. Uh, there isn't a whole lot that can go wrong. So I kind of want to touch on those ideas first um, and give you an idea of what is what's the differences in them and some of the the common reasons why one might be better for you than the other. So. Here we have our Stanley 62 low angle bevel up plane. And the nice thing about this is there's no chip breaker on it. The depth adjuster and lateral adjuster are all one. So you move this side to side in and out and it makes it fairly intuitive of how the plane actually works. You move this side to side and the blade turns side to side. You screw it in and out and the blade screws in and out. And then for the cap, you just have one cap and it's done. You just have the iron underneath. There really isn't that much to it. So you don't have to think through this and, and figure out how it's working. Wow, I need to clean that one up. I don't use this one that often, so that's why uh, it's got new duty. Um, but here I have the jack plane. And so in this case, you have a lateral adjuster up here. And this knob will move the iron side to side, so you can see the iron slide over this way or back over this way. And that will tip this in, it'll cut deeper on that side, or it'll tip this way, and this side will cut in deeper. And so you want to move it back and forth until you have the same amount of iron sticking out both sides. Now on most planes, that means the lateral adjuster is going to be slightly off to one side or the other. If it's going all the way off to one side or the other, that means you probably have your iron that has been, uh, uh, has been sharpened out of square. So one side is farther down than the other. But it is, an un it is actually rather uncommon for the lateral adjuster to be dead in the center of the plane. Most of the time, it's, it's off to one side a little way is one way or the other. So don't worry about that. I get questioned quite a bit of, uh, my, my lateral adjuster isn't right in the middle. I'm having problems. How do I get it right in the middle? Well, it really doesn't have to be. It can be off one side or the other. Then you also have your depth adjuster knob here. And this is what gets a little confusing because some of the old Stanleys, it turned one way. And then at some point, Stanley changed the threads so that it then turns the other way. Um, and this depth adjuster, let me zoom in a little closer here. And this is where a lot of the problems really come in, is just understanding this little doohickey here and how it works. There we go. So on this, you have the depth adjuster. Grab something to point with. You have the knob. And on this knob, there is a yoke. The yoke comes up here. And that yoke fits into a slot in the knob. So as you rotate this forward, it moves the yoke forward. Well, that makes, there's a little pin here that it's the fulcrum the whole thing turns on. And that pin, uh, the yoke then goes up through that and connects into the chip breaker. So up here on top, we have a slot here in the chip breaker. And you can see up on the top here, you have the yoke that comes up through it. So as I move this 
forward, that is pulling it back. So it gets a little confusing. If I run this screw forward, the blade doesn't go down deeper. Running this forward brings the blade up. And then backing this up, oops, the other way, one way, backing it up pushes the yoke down, which engages the iron to go forward. Now, in almost every plane, there's a bit of slop in this. So when you put this in here, the iron has a bit of slop forward and backward, and that's because the hole here in the chip breaker is slightly larger than the yoke holder, uh, than the, the rod going through the yoke. And so you always have a little bit of slop in there. So when you crank it down, so if I set this down, let's see where I'm at in depth, I need to go a little bit deeper. So I'm going to be backing it up. There, now it's sticking out. So if I want to back the iron up, back this out a little bit. I was gonna say. If I want to back the iron up, I'm going to then run this, and so there's a bit of slop here in between going, uh, between engaging it and backing it up. And I'll run it until it connects. There's a lot of slop in this one. And there, I just moved it so that now the yoke is just touching the back side of that notch, that, that um, slot. And I'm just gonna turn it just a little bit. So I back the iron off just a little bit. But now, before I start working, I want to push this back down forward. And I want to re-engage that yoke so it's pushing on the iron. So as it comes through, it's pushing on the chip breaker down. And what that's going to do is, as I use the plane, the, the use of the plane is trying to push the iron back up. That yoke sticking through is keeping the iron from coming back up. And I get this question all the time. Uh, hey, I can make a few passes, and then suddenly the plane's not cutting. And that's usually because this yoke is not pushing the iron forward. You want to have it there holding it in place so that the iron can't back up as it's normally used. Uh, now, before I dive into more, are there any questions? Um, they are not necessarily hand plane questions. Okay, then we will get to those in a little bit. Okay. Okay, um, so those are the basic functions. You need to know, you need to have the lateral adjustment and you need to have the depth adjustment. Once you can understand how those two function, a lot of the, the really starter problems are answered with that. And so I really want to get into that first because until you understand the actual function of the plane, uh, it, it just doesn't make much sense and you start running into problems. The next problem that pretty much every starter is gonna have, let me show this actually first, is the sharpness of the iron. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, wow. <laughs> Chinese chicken coming up today. Um, <laughs> the fun's of live. Now, it's very, very hard for me to describe what is sharp. Um, especially over a video. You know, if you were to come to my shop, I could show you this is sharp and, and this is dull and you could feel the differences and you could hear the differences. And you, there's just so many things that, that go by uh, feel that it's, it, it's hard to tell you in a video. Um, usually the best way I can describe is by shaving hair. If you can sharpen an iron and it cuts hairs, then it's starting to get sharp. Um, if it's not cutting hairs, it's dull. But there's a difference between being sharp and being really sharp. And if you want a fine smoothing plane, you've got to have that blade really sharp. A sharp blade will cut hairs, but it will take a pass or two to clean them all up. A really sharp blade will hit every single hair it touches as it slides across your arm. And it will shave the hair perfectly on every pass with very little pressure. And that is the, the best way I can describe the difference between sharp and really sharp. Um, another way is actually in the, the function of the plane. I want to kind of describe how this feels, which is a, a difficult thing to do. Um, but this plane right now is, it's functionally sharp, but it's getting close to the dull side. So I can still do some work with this. If I'm doing some cleanup on it and I don't want to do any finishing, this will work. But in some planes, that might cause you some issues. So let me show you what, that, what the difference is. Now let me set up the depth on here. So I'm going to come across here. Oop, too light. A little more. Still too light. A little more. Feeling how deep it is. I like to feel it like this. Some people actually like to look down the plane and see the iron sticking up. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. So I'm getting 
this shaving. It's probably about a thousandth of an inch thick. Really nice shaving, um, getting it clean all the way across. The problem is I'm having to push the plane down. I'm having to push the plane down as well as forward. If I change it around and I just grab the front and I pull it along, got a little bit of blade there. Actually, this one's doing really nicely. I'm just pulling it along, and I'm still getting that same shaving. So this one's sharp. Oh, that's why. This is the one I sharpened just beforehand. This is the one that is slightly dull that we're actually going to do the sharpening on. Um, so in this one, it's pretty much the same thing. If I push it down, I can get that shaving I'm looking for. But if I just pull it along like this, I'm really not getting much of any shaving. I'm getting this fuzz that's coming out of it. It's like scratching the wood. So I'm requiring that <coughs> down push in order to sharpen it. And that's a, one of the good signs that your iron is getting dull. You're, you're actually having to push it down on. Uh, before I get into that, let me talk about irons a little bit. Uh, this is an original Stanley iron, and most all of my planes have the original Stanley iron. It's a little bit thinner, and a lot of people kind of poo-poo them, but honestly, I use them uh, quite a bit. Uh, I have two planes, though, that don't have the original iron. One of them was this one, which is a Hawk iron. Uh, one of my favorites. I really like his sets. Um, and then this one is actually a prototype from DMF Toolworks. Um, so he might actually be selling these soon. Um, so this is, a, this is a fun one here. But I've been using this one quite a bit, and we need to sharpen it. So let's actually get into that. What questions we got? Okay, hang on. I'm a hanging. I'm a hanging. <laughs> so, we're going to take this apart and open her up. Anything or? Yes. I, oh, okay, sorry. Two seconds. I'm waiting. Um, see, cut twice. Oh, no. that was. Those are two questions for later. Okay, woodworking monkey. Norris style adjustment or Bailey style? Which is better? There is no better. Um, I prefer Norris style adjustments. I like the simplicity of the lateral and depth all being in one. It's really nice. But once you learn how to do a Bailey functionally, they're really no different. And then there's a lot of people who really like one and really don't like the other. So I, I can't say that one is, is better than the other. It's kind of like the difference between bevel up and bevel down. They each have their own personalities and different people who like them. But uh, yeah. So I've got my diamond plates here. I have a coarse, a medium, and a, excuse me, this is actually a coarse, what they used to call medium fine. Um, I think they now just call it straight fine. And then I have the extra fine. And then there's the, ooh, baby, you're so fine. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to do it freehand. Uh, let me turn this one around so I can show you this a little bit better. I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who knows what I'm going to say tonight? <laughs> focus. I will not. So I like to hold it back here with three fingers underneath it. The pointer comes out, pointer points in here. Hold it like that. And I'm going to bring one or two fingers over here so I have a finger all the way across the blade. I'm going to sit on here and rock it until I feel that old bevel. Right there. And then I'm going to lock my arms in place and I'm going to sharpen on this. Whoop! Got something slippery on the floor. And if you've been keeping it up and going, it's not going to take very long on this. I'm going until I feel a burr on the back here. It's starting to get there. I need a little bit more. Hmm. Need a rag. Where'd my rag go? Ah, there it is. Why am I not feeling the burr? I guess that's a little bit more dull than I was expecting it to be. Also, this steel um, is something I'm playing with. Seeing how well it sharpens it does seem to take a little bit more work to sharpen. That's often the case on harder, more durable steels. There we go. Now I'm getting a light burr. So as I, as I rub my finger up the back of the blade, I can feel it ever so slightly catching on a burr. I'm just going to do a little bit more. And that's what I'm looking for. Get that nice burr all the way across. 
Then we're going to take it over here to the fine. And I have several videos on sharpening, but I just want to show you this live to show you how much I actually put into something that has gotten really dull or relatively dull. Uh, if I caught it a little bit earlier, I'd probably just hit the strop. And now I'm looking at the scratch pattern and making sure my scratches from the previous plate are gone. There we go. And on to the extra fine. There we go. I'll put it on its back. Just rub that burr over the other way. So now the burr is off of this side and ever so slightly onto the blade side, onto the bevel side. Give it a few strokes on here. This is a uh, horse butt strop with zinc oxide, uh, excuse me, chrome oxide compound, both of which you can buy on my shop if you want to. <laughs> Woodbyright.com backslash shop. And there's a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Just going to go back and forth and tell that. You probably won't be able to see that, but I've got a tiny little hair. It's just about to fall off. And there it goes. So there. Now, I don't actually test my hair every time I sharpen because I know that's sharp. That's what I'm looking for. And so I know that if I do this, it's going to clean off this whole pass of hair. First pass, nice and clean. So there's our iron. Can put it back together. Now when I put this in here, you'll notice that I have it across like this. I'm actually going to turn it because I don't want this to hit the tip that I just cleaned up. So I'm going to turn it so it's away. Slide into place. I'm now back about a quarter inch or so. I'm going to slide it forward. And this plane is one of my finished, my smoothing planes. So I'm going to move it right up onto the edge, like a 64th or so away from the edge. Maybe even a little closer. And I'll get that locked in. Tighten this down. And I'm going to check it again. Now here's one of the problems that a lot of people have, is that the chip breaker does not seat well to the iron. And let me grab one of my other ones here. Back this one up a little bit. Oh, come on, why are you so tight? Why so tense? And if I back the iron up a good ways, then I'm not going to have a problem with that. But if I'm sliding the chip breaker all the way forward to the edge, so I get a really nice clean cut, then I need this chip breaker to be matching up with the iron perfectly. And the way you can do that is if you look through the eye of the chip breaker here, sorry, I'm out of focus there. If you look through the eye of the chip breaker here and you hold it up to the light, you can look through that eye and look and see if you see any light coming through in between the chip breaker and the iron. And oh, that will let you know if it's well fit. Okay. If it's not, what's that? Pause. The focus is off. Is it? Let me see if I can do this. Is that better? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to hold it here and look through the eye. Let me show you what that actually looks like. Is from this point here, I'm going to look through the eye and I'm going to look up at the tip inside the hole and I'm going to see if I see any light there. So I'm going to hold it up to the light here and I'm going to look through there and see if I see any light. And in this one, I actually do see some light. Um, and there's probably no way I can get that on camera. But basically, I'm looking through there. And I'm seeing that in this case, I, I'm not seeing any light from here all the way across to here, but I'm seeing a little light coming out from here to here. Just a hair tiny bit. And that might mean that this needs to be cleaned up at some point. It may have gotten dented or bent. Um, but in this case, I don't use this one as a fine smoothing planer. So it's really not a, really not a problem for this. This one is one I use for, for hogging off material. This one, on the other hand, I use it for very, very fine smoothing. And so in this case, on this one, let me see. Yeah. This one is perfect. This one, I've got a nice mating surface all the way across. Now, if you don't have a nice mating surface all the way across, what you can do is take this off. 
and I'm going to take it over here to my fine. Now normally, well, I'm just go ahead and do it. I'll pop the plate out. I'll set the plate over here. And I'm going to put just the tip of this on. Focusing. Here we go. I'm going to put just the tip of the chip breaker onto the iron itself. And I'm going to lower this down below the edge. And I'm just going to sharpen that up. Now this is a much, much softer steel, so this can go pretty quickly. And so that's why I'm usually just going to do it on the fine. And I'll put pressure on the spot where it's high rather than putting pressure all the way across. Because normally on iron, I put my fingers all the way across to put pressure on there. In this case, it's just high here in the middle. And so I'd put it on that and then run it on the plate a few times. And then I'd take it back, put it in place, and check it. And that's one of the most common problems of actual function when you're trying to set up a smoothing plane is that you don't have a nice tight fit between the chip breaker and the iron. And what happens is, let's get that wax off the back. What happens is the chip will be coming up, back this up a little bit. The iron will cut into the wood and create a curl. And that curl will then slide up the iron. And if the curl is thin enough, like you'd get on a really nice smoothing plane, it will go in between the chip breaker and the iron and it will start jamming up in there. Well, for the first pass or two, it's not a problem. It'll, it'll still curl past, but then eventually the space in the plane up front is so tight. Up here in the mouth, there's so little space that eventually one chip will then connect, catch the next one, and that one will catch the next one, and then suddenly it'll jam up the entire mouth and nothing can get through the slot. And if you find yourself jamming up all the time, and if you find this, if you find the mouth clogging up and uh, you, just, you can't get anything through, most of the time, most of the time, it is a problem with the chip breaker not fitting well to the iron. So, um, let me take this testing. What questions we got while I set this up? Okay, so apparently you've answered a lot of questions but I, you know, can only half pay attention while trying to <laughs> chat. So I'm just going to go through And you have to them. pardon my wife. She is rather tired. She's been working crazy lately. <laughs> All right. Um, so thank you for being here, babe. Yes. You're welcome. Not like I'm getting a raise here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll kiss you twice tonight. Huh? Oh, thanks. Uh, let's see. Tom West had asked, I mean, I'm... Using stones now to sharpen are diamond plates worth it? Did you talk about that? Um, diamond plates cut faster. There's no mess. You don't have to flatten them. Uh, there's just a lot of nice benefits to a, a diamond plate. The problem with a diamond plate is they cut differently. They're actually an aggregate that sticks up and will shear the metal off. On a whetstone, you actually create a slurry on top and that slurry sort of swirls around and will we'll, uh, um, polish the steel more. So grit from one does not translate to the other because um, a, a lower grit on a stone will actually give you a finer polish than a diamond will. Um, and so that's why there there's, isn't much correlation between grit. So that, that gets really confusing. We're getting people. invaded. Um, Daddy, I need to tell you something. <laughs> Arthur, right, no, not right funny. now, bud. Go play. I'll be out in a little bit. Um, okay, buddy? So that's one of the reasons why um, people who have done a lot with whetstone are used to seeing that really nice mirror polish off of the stone. You're not going to get that mirror polish off of a diamond plate because they, they, they cut differently. Um, it's sort of the difference between a belt sander and an orbital sander. Um, an orbital sander will always give you a better looking surface because the swirls are going all over the place. There isn't, there, all the paths aren't in the same way. Whereas a belt sander will always have the same path going the same way. If you end up san sanding with the same grit, you'll get the boards just as smooth one way or the other. It just, they look differently. Uh, they, they look different and so, sanding all in one direction is going to give you a very different look than an orbital sander. Yes, I'm using a power tool analogy to talk about hand tool sharpening. Um, <laughs> but so they're, they're, they're two different things. Um, is one better than the other? No. Um, there's a nostalgia to, um, to whetstones that 
they're a lot of fun to use and you can get a gorgeous shine off of them. Uh, they're just, they're messy and there's some downsides to them. Diamond plates, they're fast and they're efficient, but there isn't that much fun to them. So which one do you like? I don't know. So let's actually take this for a drive and see what we got. So I'm going to, I'm starting with the iron backed up so it's not taking any cut. I'm going to bring it up here close you to the slot. It right now. You, is it something you need to tell me? Okay, Arthur, what is it? Tell me. Okay, if it's about Zelda, it can wait. Oh. Uh, <laughs> is it Zelda? Yeah. Yeah, I'll be out later. I just need to tell it. Afterwards, okay. I'll be out we later, bud. We got uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild for the family. and uh, For the family. We got it for me to play. <laughs> yeah, I was every night in and bed. And so I eat. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our family here. So I'm starting with the iron backed up, so I'm not taking any shaving right now. I'm putting it on here, I'm not getting anything. And I'm slowly going to adjust it. I'm just going to turn it like an eighth of a turn. Just a little bit, maybe even less than that. Oh, they got a little bit of a catch there on the edge. Not quite long, deep enough yet. There we go. Yeah, let me show you these shavings. Two. So, here, let me zoom in. We have a super pretty. chat, just so you know. What's that? We have a super chat. We have a super chat. We do have a super chat. Who's it from? Tom West. Tom West. Thank you, Tom. Sarah will give you a joke here in a moment. So here's the shaving. This is probably a half a thousandth. Tiny, tiny little shaving. Beautiful mm -hmm. curl. That, that's what you want jokes. for a smoothing cut. But I know that this is really not going to take any amount of down pressure to cut. It's nice and sharp. And so I set it on here and just trying to balance it on here. I'm just letting it pulling across. And I'm getting pretty much the exact same shaving as I got earlier. That same wispy shaving. And so that's one way to know that it is sharp. So um, most common problem you're going to have is the mouth clogging up and that's usually because the chip breaker is not fit well to the iron. And if you want to see detail on that, I have an entire video uh, where I talk about fitting uh, the chip breaker what? to the iron. Okay, thank you. You done with school, bub? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, I'm so tired. All right, we'll go lay down. I'll be there in a little bit. I'll be up soon in a bit, babe. Go on, babe. Love you. Um, Bye. Yeah, our kids aren't in bed yet. Can you tell them? <laughs> so, um, no, I forgot what I was talking about. Okay, good. It's time for a mom joke. All right, mom joke. Here we go. Ready? I used to think I was indecisive. Now, I'm not sure. <laughs> that, that may is, or may not be my That mom. is you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that, I like that one. Uh, <laughs> I thought you'd like that one. <laughs> yes. So, um... Okay, so problem number one, mouth clogging up, usually the chip breaker. You want to see that. I have an entire video where I go into that. If you, if you search for wood by right chip breaker, it will come up. Um, that's actually one of the more commonly watched videos. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good one to start with. Next thing that a lot of people worry about is that there will be plane tracks. Just uh, like, uh, like train tracks, but by planes. Ah, you didn't even have to pay for that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what that is, is when, where did my other iron go? Oh, it's over here. So I've got this, which is my, uh, my number four and a half iron, uh, which is what, uh, two and an eighth wide? I gotta remember. Two and an eighth? Two and a quarter, ah, oh, two and a quarter. Um, so if it's going through, and I'm cutting a full width shaving, as it's going through, it's basically cutting a groove through the, through the wood. So it's cutting a deeper area here, and I'll have a wall over here and a wall over here where it's not cutting. Well, if you're making a deep enough cut, you will see the sides of that wall from that groove you are creating with your iron. And if you're doing your final smoothing finish, that can really be a problem because you don't want to see those lines. And so you have a couple different options. Um, some of the old timers would put a camber across the iron. And so across this whole iron, they would have like a three foot radius camber on here. So it would just be an ever so slight rounding on it. And if you go look at a lot of old furniture, 
and you rub your hand across it, you feel like this scalloping in there. You can't see it. It looks perfectly flat, but it's not perfectly smooth. Wow, I'm having issues. Well, no at more least it's Chinese not the chicken. other end. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll see this like uh, naturally undulate, undulating surface because the smoothing plane had a bit of a scallop, had a bit of a, a camber in it. And a lot of people actually will put a camber on all of their irons um, because it just it makes it a little bit easier to push, but you're not getting that perfectly flat. And there's some people who want that perfectly flat and smooth. So what you can do there is uh, Paul Sellers and a lot of other people will actually um, hit the corners of the iron as well. So when sharpening, they'll do the normal sharpening where it's on the iron and they'll be going back and forth, but then they'll do a few strokes where they pick it up and they just hit the corner of it this way, and they'll do a few strokes on the other side where they just hit the corner. So basically you're just hitting these wings so it cambers just on the outside. And so as it goes down, rather than having a sharp wall, it's a bit of a scalloped wall, making it much, much harder to see. Um, so that's, that's another common answer to it. Um, what I generally do is I, I used to do that, um, doing, hitting the corners of it, but now I just keep it flat. And this is exactly how I have my smoothing plane set up. And this is um, one of my two main go-to smoothing planes. And I'll just keep it flat like that. But the thing is, I'm doing these shavings that are about as thin as you can possibly get them. And you generally can't see that plane track from a, a shaving that thin. And if you do see it, then usually the last thing that's going to touch the wood is not a plane, uh, but a card scraper. And the card scraper gets rid of those instantly. <laughs> uh, so the card scraper is um, Sorry. often the, the last thing to touch. What's funny? Don, it's Woody's, um, gave you a super chat so for some gas X for James. <laughs> Thanks, Don. <laughs> yeah, you're not the ones who have to stay here all night long. Yeah, you don't have to roll over in bed at 3 a.m. and get a gas get a gas mask. <laughs> Sorry, babe. I love you. Mm -hmm. um, so usually the last thing I have to touch the wood is this, and so that's my answer to it. I just keep it flat and I clean up my shaving. I clean up my surface with this. Um, I just I like the way a card scraper finishes it. Uh, especially if it's if it's figured wood or something a little more difficult, card scraper has no problem with that. And I can go right through it. Um, so yeah. Well, what other questions we got right now? Hang on, I'm getting to a mom joke. Oh, mom joke. Here you go. Did I did I do? I can't remember if I did this one last time. What's that? One tectonic plate bumped into another one and said, "Sorry, my fault." Oh, oh yeah. This one, this plane is actually kind of interesting. One of the, uh, this was the second or third oh. plane that I purchased, and uh, I saw this crack on there and thought, oh, no problem. I'm gonna, I'm gonna open it up and reset it and re-glue it. But the previous owner actually glued it in place with this crack offset on here. And originally, I was like, oh man, this is horrible. I've got to either reshape the handle or I'm gonna make a whole new one. And uh, four or five years later, um, I still haven't done that because it really doesn't bother me. And I kind of like that because there's, there's a story to this that some uh, woodworker in the past put it back together. And what I'm assuming they did is they glued it in and then they ran the screw in, clamping it down with that, and it slid. And uh, you really can't readjust it once it's done that. And it's like, oh, well, I guess that's the way it is. It's one of those interesting stories. Okay, so we have another super chat. Another one. And Tom West says, for the other family members' masks. <laughs> so this mom joke is, whoops, if attacked by a mob of clowns, go for the juggler. Good advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the other, I don't know why lately I've gotten a whole bunch of questions about this. You'll see a lot of old planes where there's a hole drilled through the sole. Um, on like the number fives, it's right in the middle. The number fours, it's often just off to the side. Um, I've even seen it on some of the block planes um, in the, the heel. And uh, for some reason, it was a common thing to drill a hole through your plane so that you could hang it up on a pegboard. 
And that just drives me bonkers because why do you want to drill a hole on your plane? <laughs> Honestly, it doesn't make any difference for its function and it works just as well. And the nice thing about it is if you find a plane, a hole with a, a plane with a hole through it, it's usually going to be cheaper because the collectors don't want it. So if you ever see that, that's where it came from. All okay, right, James. What do we got? Just so you know, it's 838 and I have a whole heap of questions. Okay, let's get into questions then. Because you may have um, answered some of these and I don't know that. So, all righty. Um, if any new questions, we may or may not get to, just FYI. Let's see. Woodworking Monkey said, how should I prepare the chip breaker so that the shavings do not get under it? Talked about that one. Okay. I have an entire video on that one. If you want to look it up, wood by right dot, uh, look up, search for wood by right chip breaker. It'll come up. Okay. George Ortiz said, when adding a back bevel to the plane and you polish the edge, how are you supposed to strop it? Do you need to lift the back while stropping or keep the back flat? I don't put a back bevel on my planes. Um, the reason There's a couple different reasons I don't put a back bevel on the plane. Um, number one is it causes problems with the chip breaker because if there's a bit of a back bevel on there, the chip breaker can't get close to the edge. Um, so you're basically creating a bevel up plane. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, no, there, there's a bit of difference if you're doing something like with the ruler trick, the back bevel is so slight that it's really not going to make that much of a difference. But if you're really getting a really fine shaving, you're, you might have a problem with that. Um, but yes, if I'm doing a back bevel, um, I would strop it just like I showed there, keeping the bevel down, and then I'd flip it over. But when I flip it over, I'd just pick up the, uh, pick up the iron a little bit, so I'm just hitting the, uh, the edge. Um, but most of the time, that back bevel should be so tiny that there shouldn't be any difference between holding it flat and lifting it up a little bit. So I hope that answered your question. Okay. Um, Tom West said, does placing it diagonal while sharpening make a difference? No, no, it's just, it, it's comfortable because my hand is here and if I turn it square, I have to move my body. So I just hold it diagonal. Uh, and I, I've, I've taught myself several different hand styles and different, different ways of holding it and going across and going straight on and, um, and, and changing. Uh, that's just the way I've come to, to holding it. As long as the iron's at the right angle, that's all that matters. Let's see. Um, oh, but one little tip on that. Um, one of the reasons why I did learn to hold it in several different ways is I'll do it one grit at one diagonal, and then I'll do the next grit going perpendicular to the iron, and then I'll do the next grit on the same diagonal. And what that'll do is each time, the scratches will all be in a different um, orientation. And so that will actually let me see when I've got rid of the scratches from the previous iron, from the previous plate. All right, Debaca Maker said, so how much of a burr are you looking for? Barely perceptible. Um, just enough that your fingers feel something catching on the edge. Um, I mean, you, you, can, you can create more of a burr. The more of a burr you put on there, though, that means the more of the iron that you're using, the more of the iron you're, you're actually wasting. Um, so I do it just until I feel the ever so slightest catch all the way across. Um, hang on. Uh, Russ Corbett says, out of curiosity, I was always told to use a file to round the edge of the toe of the plane to help it glide a little easier. Any pluses or minuses in doing that? All of mine are now that way. No problem to it. Um, a lot of people like to do that. I, I honestly cannot feel the difference one way or the other. Um, and as long as the bottom is flat, it really shouldn't make any difference. But I know a lot of people out there who do that. So if you like it, go for it. Okay, Punisher Woodworking says, do you put a micro bevel on the iron on the last plate? No. Okay. No, um, I, yeah. I, I try to stay away from any extra step. Um, and it's just one more step. And as long as you've done it right, it really doesn't matter. Um, and anytime you introduce another bevel to the plane, that's one more thing you have to think about the next time you sharpen it. Because if you do put a micro bevel on it, the next time you sharpen, you have to sharpen through that micro bevel. Uh, and so it takes longer to take off material because you put an extra bevel on there. Um, and so it's just one more step that requires more work. The nice thing about that is it does, as long as you can hold that micro bevel, you will get an exact sharpening on there. And so you'll get a really nice clean edge. Um, but if you don't hit it just right, then you run into other issues. <laughs> Which is, it's a problem freehand. If you're doing it on a like a jig, like the Mark II, the micro bevel is really easy because it's just a rotation of the block and you're up at a slightly different angle. 
All right, let's see. Sharpie0089 says, is there a point at which a plain iron slash chip breaker are no longer worth continuing to sharpen or flatten? I have a chip breaker that I can't seem to get flush with on my iron. Um, on the chip breaker, no, um, because the chip breaker is a soft steel, so you can always bend that into whatever shape you want. And I've had several that I've had to manipulate quite a bit to get a good connection with it. Um, because the chip breaker should actually, rather than being flat and then having the bow on it, the whole thing should actually be cambered a bit so that when you put the screw down, it pulls the whole thing down into place. Um, and so the, the chip breaker, I really haven't ever come across one that's like, yeah, this is too far gone. Uh, now on the iron on the other side, there is a, a bit of a difference on that. Let me switch over to this. Because on the iron, you've got uh, this hole here. And you'll see a lot of old ones where the blade has been sharpened all the way back to this hole. I've actually seen a couple uh, where it's been, you know, uh, it, there's only been a, a tiny little sliver across here where someone's used it and used it and used it, and now it's just barely touching that hole. Um, this, I mean, this, on most irons, it's going to be the same steel all the way across, so it doesn't really matter. But at some point, you're getting close to this hole, and there isn't enough material here in front of the hole to actually keep this strong. Um, and so that's the point at which an iron is uh, no longer worth sharpening again. What's next? Sorry. One of these days I'm going to actually make a large pattern of a chip breaker and an iron so I can, I can show off these. So that, uh, that'd, be a, that'd be a fun thing to make. All right. So my Sting89 says, every time I start out planning, my plane stutters at the beginning of the piece. But if, it, but if I start in the middle, it's just fine. The edge is sharpened to a thousand grit and I strop. What am, what am I doing wrong? Um, most common answer is that it's not sharp enough. Um, the grit you sharpen to has almost no bearing upon how sharp the iron is. Um, I can make a plane do the exact same thing as this at 600 grit and I can make it do the exact same thing at 20,000 grit. Um, the, the, the grit has very little uh, connection to how sharp the iron is. Um, that, that's usually the, the biggest problem with that is that the plane isn't sharp enough so the iron isn't catching and holding itself down because if the, if the iron is digging down in, the iron will hold the plane down and run along. So that's why I was showing if you can just push it forward without putting any down pressure on it, the iron should engage and hold the plane in. Um, if if you're, you're pushing it across and it's not actually digging in, it's kind of sliding across the top, scraping. That's that's where the that's where I was showing earlier that doesn't uh, it's not as sharp as it should be. Um, one of the problems with with skipping at the beginning of the plane is that the back end is lower um, and you don't have the because all of your down pressure is on this back end, so you're actually pushing behind it and tipping the plane back. Uh, whereas when you're beginning, a lot of times I'll put my hand down on top of this like that, and I may even let go completely on this. And this down hand, let me show you on this one, uh, the down, the, the hand on the toe just holds this whole thing in place. There we go. And just holds this in place. So I'm putting all my pressure here. So as I slide forward, the blade engages, and now I'm into my normal use. Um, because if I, if I have pressure back here, it'll catch right on this edge. So I can catch at this corner like this. And then I'm rocking forward and I pick up. And then it kind of goes into this thing until it actually catches. And then you're actually doing the shaving. Um, so that, that, that's the most common thing is that either the blade isn't sharp or um, the, the, the technique at the beginning is a problem. Because you want to have pressure on the toe until there is board underneath the heel and then you can have pressure on both sides. And same thing exiting the board on the other side is when you come out the end of the board, one of the problems is people have pressure here and here. So as they come out the end, they're putting pressure here and it's actually tipping the plane forward. And as it tips that plane forward, um, you're gonna be rounding off the end of your board and shaving it off. Um, there is one other problem that you do occasionally grab this one. This plane, the sole on this isn't flat. It's actually rounded this way because someone did the, the fix on this and this surface is not coplanar with this surface. And so I can plane with this either putting all the pressure here or with putting all the pressure here. But if I put pressure on both, 
this actually will rock here. See if you can hear it up and down. So if if your sole is not smooth, you will have a lot of problems beginning and ending, but you may still be able to do it in the middle. Um, so that'd be one of the, the functional things to actually check is that your, your plane is perfectly um, flat and smooth. So, yeah. What's next? Alan Smith says, does white oak have a mischievous oil that covers the face so a wide board of covers the face of a wide board to keep the plane from cutting even on it. Can you read that again? <laughs> yeah. Does white oak have a mischievous oil that covers the face of a wide board to keep the plane for cutting even on it? No, uh, but it sounds like the board is not flat. Uh, that'd be my guess. <laughs> uh, whenever you're doing a, a large surface, uh, the plane, you know, especially if you're using a larger plane, it will rest on a high edge here and it'll rest on a high edge here, but the blade in the middle is actually in a valley, so the blade isn't contacting anything until it gets over to that high edge that the rest was sitting on, and then it would, it, would, it would take off the top of that hill. And that's the way you actually flatten it, is that running the plane over it will just hit the tops if the plane is long enough. But with a smaller plane, like a smoothing plane, uh, it'll actually ride up and down those, so you can actually t to clean that out. That, that's very common on larger boards. Um, but I may be misunderstanding your question on that one, so sorry, Alan. But yeah, that, I think that's one of the things that really, that really freaks a lot of people out, is wood will move hour to hour, uh, day to day. And if you're really taking fine shavings, you flatten a board perfectly smooth, you come back tomorrow and you use the same plane and now it's not cutting all the way across because the board has changed just enough that the plane isn't actually taking off that shaving all the way across. What's next? Hang on. I'm hanging. Russ Corbett asks, out of curiosity, would there be any good reason to open or widen the mouth? Um, yeah, in some cases there is very good reason for it. Um, if you are getting a newer, thicker iron, um, it is actually one of the common things that you have to file the front of the mouth open so you can fit in the bigger iron and bigger chip breaker. Um, if I'm turning a plane into a, uh, uh, into a scrub plane, I'm going to open that mouth up a long ways. Um, if my mouth is jamming, it's usually a problem with the chip breaker or the frog has moved too far forward and is closing off the mouth, try backing the frog up. Um, and it's much better to back the frog up to open up the mouth than it is to file the mouth bigger. Um, but if you, if you have an original iron in there and it's still clogging up, it's probably the meeting with the chip breaker. All right. Jimmy A says, I, can, I can't get my number three to cut without leaving tracks. Will a frog that is not flat cause my plane to leave tracks? Nope. No, that has to do with one iron either tipping one way or the other, or you're taking a thick enough shaving that you can see the, the tracks in it. At least I'm assuming that's what you're referring to. The other thing that occasionally will cause tracks is you may have some burr sticking off in the sole of your plane that's actually scratching the wood. And I've seen a couple times where you know a, a plane dropped and there's a tiny little nick and it's something that you almost don't quite feel, but it's sticking down enough that it actually scratches the wood behind the plane. All right. Um, Josiah Lacey asked, I think we talked about the thoughts on a back bevel on a plane iron. We talked about yep, that, talked right? About that. Okay. Um, don't do it unless you really like them then it's okay okay uncle bobby's hobby says do the larger jointing planes require more effort i work a whole lot harder with my six than three four or five um they require more effort in that they are wider and a wider plane means you have to put more force behind it to push it through and also they are heavier so they take more effort to get them going the nice thing about a heavier plane is once you get them going they carry along nicely. You don't have to, um, they, they, they'll, they'll flow along and then they will, they're, they're easier to stop. And so a lot of people really like that heavy feel because it just cruises right along once you get it going. Um, it, it pushes through the wood very easily, but they are harder to start. Um, and so that is, yeah. Um, 
Usually the big thing though is the wider the iron, the more force it's going to take to push through. And you get a small number three, number two, they, they push through really easily. Um, you get up something like a four and a half, it's almost twice as much effort to push a four through as it is to push a three through. Or I guess this is a two. Um, Bridget Lopez asks, what does it mean if the plane stalls out right when it touches the wood? Um, that's really mixing metaphors to talk about a plane stalling. Um, <laughs> my brain immediately jumps to push it down, add power. Um, okay. <laughs> um, can you read that again? Hang on. What does it mean if the plane stalls? <laughs> I got you now. <laughs> if the plane stalls out right when it touches the wood. Um, usually it means that it's not sharp. That, that, that's what we're talking about. Like when, when, it, when you first started in, it like judders through the wood. Um, that's usually a sign that it's not sharp or that your technique is, 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 is uh, at fault for how it's starting the wood, starting the plane. <laughs> Nose down, add more power. There's your answer. <laughs> She's typing something. Yes, they said, how is your back? And I said, he's fine, don't let him whine. Yeah. No, uh, for, those, for those of you who are knowing, uh, the, the back, it, it's, it's something that flares up from time to time whenever I do something new or different. Um, it wasn't as much from the actual work itself as just, it, it, it's, I have an injury from UPS that just, it's that one spot in a muscle that goes occasionally wonko. And he's just I'm fine a couple days old. later, I'm good to go. Yeah, old. <laughs> Back in my day, <laughs> I we used to have to, go to, to cut down trees, not one of them flipping axes. <laughs> Your mom has such sympathy for you right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, question. Let's see. Dennis Miko asks, is sharpening... Okay, hang on. I got to read this again. Is sharpening bench plane and block plane and... and and up angle planes the same process. Yep, exact same thing okay, to sharpen good. a bevel up as a bevel down. I'm glad that made sense to you. Yep. It's, it, it's just the exact same thing as a chisel as any other thing. It's making two points meet. Okay, uh, Butch Landry says, do you soften the edge of the soles? I do not, some people do. Depends on personal preference. Really doesn't matter though. Uh, David Aaron says, how do you reset a bevel on a blade? Um, I change the bevel I'm holding it at and sharpen it at that angle. <laughs> really, that's, that's about it. Um, if, if, like, if it's at, you know, a 40 degree angle and I want to take it to a 20 degree angle, I'm going to have to take off a lot of material. And so that case, I'm going to go to something really aggressive. I'm probably going to pull out like 30 grit sandpaper and grind it down on that. I am thinking about making a, a foot-powered grinding wheel I can put on my lathe, um, but I haven't gotten there yet, so we'll see. But yeah, normally it's just change the angle and sharpen it down. Oh, excuse me. Oh, Alan just super super chatted. James Bebdo, Bebdo, medical fun, backer, backer. <laughs> Maybe I'm missing Thanks, something. Alan. So, okay, hang on, hang on. We have to mom joke, and then we will go back to questions. Why was the ice cream lonely? Why? Because the banana split. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Ah, uh, let's. No, you're not. Mm, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Lee said, "When looking at a used plane for purchase, is it possible for the blade to be consumed or too short to function?" Yes, uh, that was what I was talking about earlier that if the edge starts to get up near the, the hole, um, then that is, is too much. Uh, but basically, as long as there's still blade, you can still work it. But eventually it gets so thin that the middle section where it touches that hole becomes weak. And at that point, you get a new one. And there, there were people, uh, it, it, for most hand tool people who sharpen by hand, it's not really a problem. Most irons, will last you 30, 40, 50 years worth of hand sharpening, um, depending upon how much you, you use it daily. 
but the problem is a lot of people would actually take them to the grinder and change up the bevel and you eat through a lot of material much quicker on that and so you do find some that have completely completely gone and he was trying to say Bobby Joe that's it well <laughs> I was wondering but I was like maybe there's a joke I'm missing <laughs> um, thanks Alan <laughs> Kenny and I'm going to mess this up. Is it in, in Jetta and Yetta Horn? Um, how critical is it that the entire sole of a number seven plane is flat? Um, it's really not that important. Uh, for a number seven, I'm going out here. Most of the time when you're jointing, it's important that the, the toe, the heel, and the mouth are perfectly flat. And those three spots are in coplanar. And if that's fine, and you're going to be jointing with the board, this will work perfectly. Um, it, there really isn't any issue that you have to flatten the whole thing. Um, now, if you intend to be doing smaller boards with a big plane, then you need to flatten the whole thing. But as long as you're doing boards that are longer than the plane you're using, the only things that are important are the toe, the mouth, and the heel. Get those down, and the plane will work for you. Okay, so these next two are kind of amusing that they came in order. Because Tom said, is it worth to get a number eight if you have a number seven? And then Nathan Grant says, I have a number six, and it's hard to find an, an affordable number seven. Is a normal number six good enough for now? <laughs> um, yeah, honestly, a number six will be a perfectly good jointer. The longer the board is, the easier it is to get a true flat surface. Um, because you are referencing off of a larger surface. However... You can do any jointing you'd need a large seven or eight for with a number four. It's just you have to have something else to tell you it's flat. This will not tell you if it's flat because this will go with the undulations. Um, so it depends on what you like. You can do everything with a number four or a number five. You don't need the other ones, uh, but they do make it nicer. Now as to the number seven or number eight, the number eight is wider. So if you are ever double jointing boards, so in other words, you want to joint two boards together, you take those two boards and you put them side by side to book match them and you plane both of them together. Um, that way when you bring them up, if there is any twist in the plane, it's gonna put the exact same bevel angle on this one as it's gonna put on the other one. So when you bring them up together, they'll match and match perfectly. Um, so it makes things really nice to do both together. But if you're doing wider boards, they might be wider than your six or your seven, in which case then getting a wider number eight is useful for that. Um, but other than that, Six, seven, eight, they're all big planes and they're all joint boards nicely. Um, if you do get bigger ones, great, but do you need them? No. So let's see. Curtis Beeler said, What are the money values for each planer? Like, is there a range? It is wild ranges depending upon collectability and, and uh, anywhere from a buck fifty to five hundred dollars. Um, unless you get into a number one, you can get over a thousand dollars for one of those. Um, there, there's a wide variability on how old the plane is, its collectability, its, its uh, condition, um, <laughs> lots of different things in there. But to give you an idea, uh, a restorable, rusted plane that still needs a lot of work, 10 to 20 bucks normal, um, some places maybe a little bit more, some places maybe a little bit less. Um, getting something that is ready to go um, but just needs a little bit of cleanup, usually in the twenty to sixty dollar range, and then it has been restored, is functioning. Most of the planes, it's around fifty to eighty dollars. Um, more for the seven and eight; those tend to be around a hundred dollars because they're a little bit bigger. Um, and then the the number two is often around two hundred to three hundred dollars, um, just because it's more collectible. And so there's there's a wide variety of, of different numbers on them. Okay, you may have just answered this question, so I'm not sure. So Mimi asked, how do you plane how do you plane flat a book match panel using a low angle bevel up jack plane? The tarot in the opposing side is terrible. <laughs> yes. Um, you don't. <laughs> no, honestly, I'll, I'll get it close with the plane and then I'm gonna get a card scraper and clean it up. Um, Unless I have a really, really fine-tuned bevel-up smoothing plane, I'm not going to go against the grain. And with, with a bevel, excuse me, a fine-tuned bevel-down smoothing plane, with a low-angle bevel-up plane, um, it's going to get underneath that. Now, you can get 
a high angle iron, you can get a 50 degree iron in there, but you still can't get a chip breaker on it. And so it's still missing a few features that make it a really nice smoother. But even then with a really nice smoother, you still run into some tear out issues. And that's where a card scraper or a cabinet scraper really come into their own and can clean it up. And so I'll get it close with the plane and then I'm gonna spend a good bit of time with a card scraper or a cabinet scraper and really smooth it out. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm generally going to do is I'm going to plane one board all one direction and I'm gonna get as close to that line as I can. And then I'm gonna plane the other board from the other direction and get as close to that line as I can. And there's that thin strip right along the line where I just run the plane down it and I'm gonna get tear out on one side or the other. Um, and I'll clean that out with the, with the card scraper. So yeah, it's one of those things where Book match pieces, they're, they're a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, so Tom West has a super chat that hey, says, Tom, thanks, thank James. Um, so, are you ready? I'm ready. For I'm chemists, ready. alcohol is not a problem. It's a solution. <laughs> <laughs> All right, two more, and then... There were questions that were asked earlier that weren't necessary. If we don't get to your questions, we'll have more lives related. or you can send me a message. Send James a private message. All right, let's see. Uh, I Griffey 932 said, how can I camber a plain iron with sandpaper? I don't have a grinder. Yes, um, I actually have a video of that. You look for wood by right, um, uh, wood by right scrub plane. Um, that will come up. Um, because I have an entire video where I take, actually, where is it? This one. I take a number five that has several problems and I turn it into a scrub plane by cambering the iron with some sandpaper. Um, and that's actually a good running joke between me um, and, uh, um, oh, I can't remember his name, <laughs> YouTube channel. Uh, he made fun of me and then I got back in the room and the two of us did a collab on it. It was a lot of fun. Um, oh, that's been a while. It. What's that? That's been a while ago, right? Yeah, that was like uh, two, three years ago. Rex Kruger, there we are. Uh -huh. yep. I was going to be going out to his place, but uh, that got canceled. Actually, it got postponed to September now, so we'll see. Oh, it is? Mm -hmm. Oh, good to know. All right. <clears throat> Christopher Les said, would you use a number seven on a shooting board? Sure, you can use any plane on a shooting board. Um, I would think a five would be easier. I really like using a five or actually use my, my low angle um, bevel up plane. It's one of the places where I really do like it because in grain, it's great for that. Um, the only problem with using number seven is it's heavy and it's hard to start and you're really cutting through a lot of material. You need to put a lot of force into it. Um, so it's harder to push a number seven through a shooting board than it is to a number five. Um, but if you have the force to do it, then go for it. No real problem to it. Is that it? And that Related to hand tools, yes. Cool. And if I didn't get to your question, uh, let me know. Otherwise, we'll have a live next week and we can shoot some more questions then. So um, I hope you like this. If you have any ideas or something you'd like to see us do, let me know that. And I think that'll do it for now. Anything I'm forgetting? Oh, there could be lots of things you're forgetting. I am always. <laughs> Until next time, have a wonderful day.